So Brett, thank you for being in conversation with me today. How are you right now? I'm good. I'm in Berlin and it is very hot, uh, but the winter is approaching. So I hope it's going to stay, stay hot for a while, but in winter Berlin there's always a strange, the strange um, anxiety that, that appears before the winter. Mm. Everyone starts to know that it's coming. It's funny. I was actually just in Berlin. Well, by the time this conversation comes out, it'll be a while ago, but literally last week and it was hot and it was really surprising that it was that hot. Um, well, so um, from your vantage point in Berlin, what do you think is going on if you're going to stab a guess? Or what do you imagine is going on in the global human psyche right now? In the global human psyche? Mm. The vibe I pick up is that everyone's in a bit of a daze, but that, maybe that's just me. I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I sense that there's some strange like post-pandemic kind of trauma or something mm -hmm. lurking in the world. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's the, the global. I also feel like oh, I go into the internet right now and it feels like a ghost town. Hmm. Uh, like a digital ghost town and also i don't know if that's me or the world it's kind of hard to tell nowadays with curated digital platforms whether your experience is being shared by other people or if it's just something hmm. um that's uh maybe i just mean because i spend too much I, I used to spend too much time on twitter and twitter has become a terrible oh. ghost town so yeah. that in a way is maybe affecting my viewpoint on how quote unquote the world is hmm. so as soon as I can find a way to exit Twitter or so-called X, I think my viewpoint in the world will improve. Yeah. <laughs> it is weird. I was thinking about that this week. I was talking with them um, with a futurist this morning, a wonderful woman called Tracy Follows. And we were talking about the impact, the kind of the, the um, quietening, oddly, impact that social channels are having on robust discourse and how so many of the channels that we've kind of grown up with in the last sort of 10 years are going through massive transitions and are no longer fit for purpose. And I think yeah. Twitter is one of those. It's like, I have a very similar sensation when you go on, you see some people are still posting, but then some of the stuff where you're actually sharing and trying to network out to other platforms. Yeah, um, I know they, they shut it down. Yeah. Cause I mean, so I like, use Substack to write my kind of longer pieces. And at some point, <laughs> Elon basically shut down links to Substack. So you can't really promote that on Twitter. Um, and I noticed a massive drop off in, in engagement, mm. which maybe is good for me. Maybe it's good to be forced to like leave that platform yeah. and find something new. Um, yeah. But I sense, yeah, maybe, maybe people like me who are used to having those kind of public forums where you discuss are sensing like, like, a, like a little bit like lost in a way in terms of like where, where to in the digital realm do you find yeah. a sense of community? Um, so there's a little bit of liminality there. Yeah, uh, being scattered maybe, to the digital winds. <laughs> maybe it's productive. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I, so, I sense in the world, the people, there's lots of people who are quite like anxious and stuff. And, you know, mm -hmm. even when I talk to like my mother and stuff, for example, she says, you know, it's not just you who feels these things, like lots of people are feeling these things. Yeah, um, I think so. Same. And so so among the kind of like, I think there is definitely a, a sense of anxiety in many spaces for a variety of different reasons. What are some of the most, and maybe you don't have any, uh, but I am curious to ask, what are some of the most pressing concerns you have right now or things that are top of mind in terms of the trajectory of our, of our little human experiment? Oh. Um, well, you know, in the back of my mind, I have stuff like, you know, climate change and things like that, but I'm not, I, there's other, there are other people who focus on that particular issue. So I'm aware of all these various, like big mega topics going on. Um, <laughs> there used to be this like report called the state of the world report. I don't mm. know if it still, I don't know if it still gets released, but when I was like a, a student, I used to always like, look at this state of the world report and they'd have like reports and things like you know climate change biodiversity state of the world's fisheries 
state of like authoritarianism and so on. And you could basically pick from this like menu of all the kind of problems that you could maybe <laughs> ded dedicate yourself to, um, or met maybe needed some kind of, um, yeah, <laughs> some sort of solution or like, uh, uh, but I, I guess more in, in recent years, I sort of have been focusing in a lot on the kind of um, dynamics of money and digital automation and stuff like that. So I guess I have a bias towards seeing all the kind of, um, what's the word, uh, disassociation and discombobulation or whatever you want to call it of the digital realm hmm. and of like new technologies. Um, so that's like where a lot of my, uh, concerns lie. It's mm -hmm. sometimes interesting when I go to like South Africa where I'm from and you'll like, I'll turn up, you know, say some of my family or like, say like my Zimbabwean cousins and they don't really notice a lot of the stuff because they're like mm -hmm. sitting on a farm and they're not thinking about what Elon Musk is doing, you know, oh, but well, in really my world, I'm to forced to it. engage with this, like, <laughs> these egotistical douchebags and stuff who have like too much power and things. So it's, uh, it's always hard to know. Yeah. Did that, well, answer your question? that. Did answer your question? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of what's on your mind. One of the sort of, um, yeah. One of the key things that we're having to deal with is, is stupid people in power making extraordinarily short sighted decisions that are going to impact billions of, of lives, not just human. Um, so one yeah. of the things I'm that, worried um, about the rise of the of the reactionary right wing. That's one thing that's often affecting me because it affects the space hmm. around, around around topics around money. There's a lot of heavy right wing stuff that comes in, so I'm often huh. forced to engage with the rise of the new right, which is not great for my nervous system. But it's <laughs> so it's always there though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's the there's two things. One one is kind of how do you keep facing into these problematic and stressful and anxiety provoking areas without kind of creating a sense of burnout where it's just you, you it's almost like we're by engaging in it if we're not careful we shoot ourselves in the foot by overwhelming our systems to the mm. point where we just can't function clear-headedly clear-heartedly about it so i want to what are some of the things that you're noticing seeing as you've you've pointed something really interesting there about the the kind of reactionary right when you say that, what are the key things that you're seeing? What are you most um, noticing there? Um, I mean, there's many things probably, but, you know, I come from a, like a left wing. My family wasn't like le left wing. I grew up. I mean, I come from a very conservative country and context, mm. but uh, I mean, I became left wing. And so you know, that's so my formative sort of, um, you yeah, know, my original kind of position in the world was uh, sort of from that kind of, you know, political position. Although I worked in finance and stuff. So that's kind of where I built my, I was like a left wing finance guy originally. That was the kind of persona <laughs> that people associated with. A rare with. species. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I worked in derivatives and, um, but then I guess what I've seen over the last 10 years has been this weird, topsy-turvy kind of shifting of the stuff where this new very skillful like ideologues or sort of strategists just call them like right-wing strategists were very very successful at splitting the left hmm. um like almost like if you got like a herd of antelope that are that are, that are running and you manage to and you're a group of predators and you manage to like hive off hive them off and then sort of take them down maybe that's not the best metaphor but the, maybe it's very I, apt <laughs> i've seen very like i've seen very very skillful stuff on the on the right about starting to associate for example um corporate power with like left-wing thought which is crazy for like left-wingers wow. from the like the 90s and stuff where they would be like we're the antithesis of corporate power Whereas a lot of what the new right has been managing to do is reframe the discourse as being like the elites versus everybody else. And then like planting the idea that like people with progressive thought are the elites, um, hmm. and thereby capturing whole sections of people who used to consider themselves left wing. And this happens to me a lot, especially in my work around cash, defending the cash system, because uh, it attracts um, a lot of the cash stuff is basically anti-corporate. 
Yeah. Um, but the far right has managed to capture a lot of that discourse in the public domain. So like, for example, in the UK, you people like Nigel Farage are going out being like, protect our cash system and stuff. Um, and there's a lot to unpack there, but basically it's quite hard for people like me who were, who've been involved in sort of anti-corporate a type of, mm. or this corporate critique um, right now, because a lot of that's becoming associated with the kind of right wing and lots of like sort of moderate lefties are backing away from it. All right. And so it's, it's tricky. I mean, a very simple example is I went to Totnes recently, which is this oh, yeah. kind, of, kind of like bougie town in, in um, <laughs> the UK. I mean, it's not, a, it's, it's not only bougie, but it's quite hippie. It's quite alternative. <laughs> And there's like yeah. a staged battle going on in the streets of Totnes between this group called The Light, which is this new, very popular kind of conspiracy newspaper that's doing oh, the God. rounds in the UK. Um, and people set up these booths where they hand out this newspaper. All right. And it's very right wing, right? They have like climate change denial. They have, you know, COVID is a conspiracy. And then they have support the cash system against the full to digital totalitarianism of, you know, all the big digital firms. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's actually a very progressive position, <laughs> you know, to say like, we're going to protect a non-automated form of money in an accelerating capitalist economy is actually kind of like lefty, you know? Um, <laughs> but it's crazy. So that, but they're, they're combining it with like, and climate change is a conspiracy and this kind of stuff. And the people who are getting into it don't perceive themselves as being right wing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's very, very interesting um, and quite disturbing. And I have, I have to spend too much time engaging with it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a weird one. I was thinking recently about, um, and even talking about it puts me slightly on edge, but I think it's, it's important to talk about these things. I was listening recently to an episode on a podcast in the UK between two women talking about Russell Brand, who is a figure that I just find incredibly irritating, but also very good at what he does. He's a convincing persona. And what, what they were broadly saying was kind of to your point that one of the reasons why his mixed messaging is so effective and so dangerous, essentially, is because it has, depending on how you look at it, it kind of shapeshifts. It has the trappings of elements of quote unquote liberal progressive ideals while also kind of seeding the conspiracy theories mm -hmm. and then seeding ideas about radical independence. And so there's this kind of, and I've seen people that I know go to these sorts of events where they feel like they're being, I don't even know what the word progressive even means anymore. And that's the problem where these definitions suddenly get completely yeah, yeah. muted and infiltrated, but they're going to these things and coming away talking about stuff with such an uncritical perspective that it's um it's really problematic and so you for the first time yeah. i think you don't have a clear left and a clear right you have folks who are able to kind of cherry pick from across the spectrum to create this weird hybridized kind of chimera of a beast yeah, which for is sure. at once kind of it brings people together and it also splits people from actually having conversations that can well, help well, us to better Brand understand is, the is issues. It's a very interesting case study because Russell Brand back in let's say 2015 or so, he kind of came out as a socialist, right? <laughs> Remember he had this he had this interview maybe it was on Jeremy Paxman's show or something uh, I forget which show it was it's like a British TV show. He had an mm. interview where he basically did this big anti-corporate rant and said that, you know, we've got to take back power and stuff, right? Which is very lefty, yeah, right? And he overtly called himself a socialist, all right? And so he kind of came out as this political figure because people had previously associated him with being like a comedian. Yeah. Um, and then I remember that time because I was involved in left-wing politics around then that every single lefty in London was desperately trying to get Russell Brand's email so that they could try to influence him because they saw that he had quite a kind of un-nuanced position. And they were like, well, as long as we can just find a way to sort of be the person who advises him and they can use his platform to try to get the ideas out, mm. All right? And there were various people who managed to kind of get in a bit. And, but he was very kind of, he was a bit... Um, clueless about who the dodgy actors were or who the 
decent actors were, right? Hmm. Um, but then sort of post-pandemic, he kind of realized, I think, that maybe it was a strategic decision. I can't quite tell. He realized yeah. that, the, that, the, that the atmosphere in the world had shifted and he plays, he play, decided to start playing into it. And so what he does now is he sort of pretends to be a lefty, kind of, but he's like, we are beyond left and right. But de facto, his audience has become right wing and he de facto curates everything yeah. to appeal to them. They all the language that he uses now, all the topics that he decides. And I know this, for example, in the realm of money, he recently put out this video about central bank digital currencies. Now, this takes some unpacking, but basically in the cashless society debates, in the, in the debates around, do you think cashless society is good or not? Hmm. If you're a left winger, the thing you will choose to focus on is the fact that Visa and MasterCard and the banking sector are taking over the monetary system oh, wow. via their digital payments platforms. If you're a right winger, what you're going to fixate upon is the hypothetical possibility that the nation state or the government will launch a digital currency, all right? Because you mm -hmm. can have that whole state versus market kind of thing mm -hmm. that sits there. Russell puts out the, the latter. He doesn't talk about Visa and MasterCard and Barclays and Santander. Mm -hmm. He talks about the hypothetical like government digital payment systems that are going to spy on you. Um, and the fact that he views that as a critical topic suggests that he's like, deliberately curating his, his content to a right-wing audience. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, all the people who are sort of left-wing who've been going along with him, which includes people like my mother, for example, who's watched Russell Brand for a really long time. Um, <laughs> although now she's starting to realize she's, you know, she's telling me that she can't stand him anymore. But yeah. um, they're getting carried along with it. Right? Yeah. So he's interviewing Tucker Carlson, and then Tucker Carlson's interviewing Donald Trump, and there's this whole kind of network forming. And Oof. then there's Andrew Tate, and Elon Musk is promoting Andrew Tate to me on Twitter now on X now, you know, so they, they're all kind of like in a strange way, like collaborating, they kind of like recognize each other and they're forming a network and they're being like, what our position is going to be is like everybody versus the, the elites. Um, and that's, you know, somehow they don't represent the elites. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think yeah. there's something really, I, I don't know, it, when I think about sort of what, what's at the heart of this decision-making, my... Uh, the thing I tend to fantasize towards is the fact that it just makes financial sense for these people to make these strategic decision decisions. And there's very little thought about the actual impact of shaping the narratives and behaviors of millions of people. I don't, mm. I mean, but it's hard to, and then at some point you just have to think, well, what's the point in thinking about it? Um, but I want to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the cashless stuff that's going sure. on, <laughs> which, because <laughs> it's all connected to the, the, politics of a rapidly shifting financial sector and mm. i in research for this conversation i was reading actually i think it was on the on the hmrc website right here so that basically in may of last year of 2022 the uk government passed measures requiring that the largest banks and building societies in the uk be subject to new financial conduct authority powers so that people can keep withdrawing actual hard cash Mm -hmm. throughout their communities in the UK. Now that's well and good, but when I went back to London this summer to escape the heat of Barcelona, so many shops on my local high street, restaurants in particular, um, would no longer accept cash. And I'm thinking, hang on, but there's people here, you know, the, the local guy who does um, the rehealing of my shoes and keys, they accept cash. But there's a lot of businesses that just won't. And how does that work if it's still legal tender but you go into an establishment and they say, but we don't recognize it. And then what does that mean when, for instance, lots of people were um, without, without shelter on the street and begging for money? I don't have coins in my purse anymore. And if I want to give, I have to take myself to a cash point, convert that into coins somewhere like the local, I don't know, Sainsbury's, what have you, and then make sure I have coins on me. And I'm starting to make that intentional choice just because I don't do it by accident yeah. anymore. What are your thoughts about the legal tender, cash, cashless oh, kind I've, of restaurant shop thing? That's a massive topic. And the problem about asking me that question is, <laughs> is that I'd go way, way deeper than the average. That's the whole point the of asking person. you the question. <laughs> so on the legal tender question, the legal tender question is fairly easy because um, legal tender is a legal concept, um, which doesn't mean somebody has to accept cash. 
what it means is that if you're in debt, somebody has to accept it. Hmm. All right. So if you turn up at a shop, you're not in debt to that shop, right? Uh, and so they can say, we're going to refuse this money from you. What if you if, eat really quickly and then you go, if, oh, if, however, gosh. yeah. So if, <laughs> if you've somehow got into debt with them, yeah. then they have to accept it. So if you think about a very crude way of thinking about this is legal tender laws prevent a creditor from stopping a debtor escaping their debt. If you imagine an old feudal lord who says mm. who actually likes to keep people in debt, prefers mm. it if people stay in debt to him, right? Um, by saying, oh, I'm not going to accept your tribute. You're still in mm. debt to me. You know, a legal tender law would say if the person is trying to escape their debt, you have to allow them to do it, wow. right? And this is what, if they are presenting this particular thing to you, this counts as a thing that you have to allow. Mm. So... Legal tender laws are actually quite complex because, you know, they'll have very specific things about how much of a particular denomination the person's required to accept. So if you owe like a million pounds to somebody and you rock up with a, a, a pickup truck full of one pence coins, <laughs> the, the legal tender laws say, actually, that's not really an acceptable way to discharge, discharge your debt. So you have to do it in a higher denomination or something like that. Okay. okay. So those are the legal tender laws. So the way you would experience it in London, if you want to play with that is to like, yeah, try to eat your food before that you pay for it or something like that. Um, and then you can make a claim that actually now you're in debt and they now have to let you escape the debt. Um, hmm. But so, so that's, that's the legal tenor thing. But in terms of like the kind of the question around cash and acceptance, the main thing to the main frame that I would put it into is automation. Um, if you, and this is like a very broad, framing of it mm -hmm. right? but it's probably the most important one to to think about in any capitalist economy there's always going to be at any one point a large number of players trying to automate all right because mm -hmm. that's how they cut costs um and then if you imagine that the capitalist economy is like a vast network where everybody's connected together those processes will slowly filter through and they will kind of like pull upon each other. So if you think about like, you know, Adam Smith's invisible hand concept, um, what's basically been said there is that in a market economy, the actions of other people mm -hmm. pull and push you around and pull you around without you mm -hmm. sort of knowing where they're coming from. All right. So you can imagine yourself tied to a bunch of other people with like string or something, right? Or invisible strings. Um, and then part of the question comes in a vast interdependent system like that, who has the most power hmm. to who has the most relative power to push and pull everybody around all right and so often it's the big firms all right so the big firms want to automate because they like to fire people they like to speed things up accelerate things and so on hmm. so lots of the decisions that get made for example tfl or the big transport hmm. system in london the buses stop accepting cash all right if you imagine the board meeting that went in behind there, there was a bunch of TFL executives. They said, we wow. will shave off a certain amount of time by doing this. Push it out. It will happen. You know, there wasn't a consultation with the public. It was a decision to optimize a particular autom to auto to automate, right? That will then in turn filter through to the public via, you know, at first there'll be some resistance, but then at some point mm. people realize it's futile. They don't have enough political voice to resist. It takes too much energy to resist. Um, so they'll just accept it and they'll be yeah. forced to then to, to find a way to, um, to, to deal with it. <laughs> and so that, that happens all over the place in London. So what's happened right now, basically, is that lots of the businesses have realized that it's become culturally acceptable or people have stopped resisting. So now you, you can just do whatever you want. You can now just automate without caring. Um, so all the businesses mm -hmm. are, are just running with it. And so lots of the small businesses, especially the kind of upper middle class businesses, who don't have sort of working class clientele as, as their clients will basically just force people to use digital payment. Yeah. Right? So you'll arrive there and they'll say, you cannot do business with, business with us unless you do business with big finance and big tech. Yeah. Right? Apple Pay, what's Apple Pay? You having to use a giant big tech corporation in conjunction with your bank, the banking sector. All right. 
So they will basically lay down the conditions. We're saying we have entered into an alliance with big finance and big tech. If you want to stay in this economy, you have to do the same thing. You have no choice. That's insane. All right. And of course, these are there's a bunch of other feedback loops going on because the banking sector, for example, is shutting down all their branches and ATMs. So if you're a small business and the banking sector is shutting down its branches, it makes it harder for you to deposit cash, which means you're more likely to then make that decision to force everybody else to stop using it. Yeah. So in the end, what happens is a business automation decision gets translated into the public. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll start getting culturally normalized and people will start to invent narratives. So they're like, oh, well, I guess we chose this. I guess it's convenient, blah, 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 blah. And they'll adapt. Um, and what's the most fascinating thing to, to, to see in this process is how the very same person who perceives that, if you took a snapshot of them 10 years ago, they mm. don't have that perception in their head at all. Hmm. All right. So they basically learn through cultural, like mimetic processes yeah. to perceive cash as inconvenient. They didn't yeah. actually originally experience it like that, but now they do. So they've actually hmm. learned to experience it in a certain way. And the amazing thing is that you go cross culturally, for example, to South Africa or to Germany, where I'm here, the very same person in exactly the same socioeconomic situation does not experience the same thing. They don't experience inconvenience, right, of, for example, cash. So mm -hmm. there's almost like a kind of like a relativity of inconvenience across time and space. It's basically determined by the current state of your corporate sector in the country. In the UK, the corporate sector is basically so powerful that they've managed to create this societal um, consensus yeah. uh, on this, right? Um, but you live in Spain, right? Uh, yeah, or, and in Barcelona, or, I mean, you you can pay by card, but mostly people people bars prefer it when you pay in cash. And, and you wouldn't feel ashamed if you were in a middle class bar and you took out cash, right? Exactly. If you're in London, you will feel ashamed. You will have learned it's, by it's now weird. there's something something wrong with you if you're doing it. Yeah. So, so basically, you will take on that belief, and so this is what's amazing. And so you'll start to the overarching tendency in the capitalist system will always be for that automation, but if you're a company, you have to go, go slowly to try and slowly get people on board with it, mm. right? Because human mm. beings are physical, tactile beings that <laughs> don't actually like being digital acceleration gods, right? <laughs> Whereas Amazon does like being that. That is what Amazon yeah. feels comfortable in, all right? So you've got to train human beings to, to be like that. So, I mean, one of those fascinating things in London right now, if you go there, is uh, Tesco, which of course is the gigantic supermarket chain, has, is slowly teaching people that not only will cash be refused, but also you're going to have to use these automated self-checkout counters oh, because they, they don't, they don't want to have to hire anybody. And also when you're there, they want to automate security. They don't want to have to hire security guards. So what they're going to do is they're going to put these CCTV cameras in front of you so you see oh your own face while you're doing the checkout. And the, the point of that is to create a panopticon effect where you start to oh. imagine you're being watched, right? So they're basically, these are automation plays. It's like, we'll automate the, the payment system. We'll automate the checkout process. We'll automate security, all right? Mm. And that's a standard corporate process. And you can imagine the boardroom at Tesco with a bunch of like probably white guys sitting there with the mm. Excel spreadsheets being mm. projecting across all the Tesco stores how much they'll save if they force everyone to do this. Right, and they'll they'll say this this makes sense. Let's do it, and because they got such but cultural in, power, they can. Yeah, and but also in the UK, like I, I, I don't know how much to go into depth here, but um, just from a felt sense perspective, I've lived in London for very many years, and going back every few years, well, now it's been obviously going back more often than not. But then there was a pause during the pandemic, and going back now after the pandemic has ricocheted its way through all the businesses and people have gone digital and the rest of it. It's it's weird to see how so many places that I knew and loved have become devoid of this sense of it's got like genus loci, the sense of soulfulness that you might used to mm. have at you know Camden or um, yeah, parts of yeah, Shoreditch, yeah. and and part of that hollowing out to me is directly connected with a hyper materialistic push towards making every single square space. Um, monetizable and so then yeah, yeah, you know yeah. an example like tesco it used to be um and in small shops you still have this that you would go and at least i would know the people who work there and you could have a little chat and there was a sense of social fabric mm, a sense of sure, yeah. and of course all of that. that's 
Yeah, even in the main stores, but that's completely eroded when suddenly yeah, you're down yeah. to two staff people and you're having to, it's just. Yeah, well, yeah. One, of the, one of the ways that I would maybe like analyze it is that in an economy, a capitalist economy, and this is, you know, it's a, it's a crude term, but like there are particular tendencies that <laughs> quote unquote it wants. If you're imagining mm. capitalism as a kind of like systemic force, <laughs> one of the things it wants is to just remove all forms of non-commercial interaction from from like markets, all right? Yeah. Human beings individually don't want that, but the systemic structure does, all right? Yeah. And so a large part of, you know, the sort of history of capitalist stuff, you'll have capitalist markets, but there's still lots of non-capitalist elements to them. All right. Mm -hmm. Anthropologists are very aware of this. You know, be like you'll find people engaging in markets, but they're also sitting there talking to each other. They're also taking too long. They're not prioritizing <laughs> efficiency. They, you know, they'll they prefer to hang out and have sociality rather than just like optimizing the speed. Yeah. Um, you know, you, your uncle owns a store and he gives you freebies and so on. There's all this kind of stuff going on, which is not actually governed by. Let's put it the capitalist spirit in a way, right? Yeah, and the sort of the overarching thing is how much you let that become unbalanced or how much you keep that, that, that balance going. So if you go to places like, you know, Italy, for example, and even, you know, Barcelona and South Africa, you find still quite a high balance hmm. between those sort of more informal elements of markets and the sort of big, you know, corporates. It'll be, it'll be big yeah. corporations there, but the person at the counter isn't, you know, behaving like a robot um they smile they talk to you they take too long technically according to a corporate executive to process the, the goods and so on mm. um but it feels very different it feels quite mm. human all right um and the, the crazy thing if you even like if you go to london now it feels gentrified in the smaller businesses precisely because all the smaller businesses and like maybe i'm simplifying it too much but they're all starting to use the corporate systems Right, they're basically becoming standardized. Um, like they, they're locking into a broader system, mm -hmm. um, and, and, so, and sometimes in like you know one of the uh, ways I often like in viewing economies is around balances of power. Um, you know, balances of power between public and private. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, transparency and surveillance and all these things. And you know, human beings are pretty good at understanding balances of power. You know, in terms of like. You maybe don't want, you, you, often people appreciate the idea of keeping a balance of power, all right? And yeah. informal and formal is one of those very important balances of power because if you have a totally informal economy, it can often be very chaotic and mm. you are unsafe or you don't, you, you don't know if the contract's going to work. But if you have a totally formalized economy by which there are all these huge structures constantly standing between you and other people, it feels dead. Mm. It feels yeah, soulless totally. and shit, basically. All right. Mm. And you feel that particularly in like Northern European countries. If you rock up in Sweden, these places, they're incredibly formalized societies. They work very well, but they feel quite like if you're, if you're like a Mexican <laughs> or a South African and you arrive, you're like, God, like what's going on here? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. And, you know, again, there's cultural differences between what people appreciate. But I think like in London right now, that's, that's going on very heavily. And lots of people, for example, like in working class communities who are used to the some more sociality mm. in interactions are suddenly being like shafted, you know, being told um, that's no longer acceptable. The new mode is to have like bougie shops that are cashless and you can't sit there. You got to be like, I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, yeah. but like, um, so, yeah. It's like a it's mm. like a virus. It's weird, and the thing that's so obsessing about it is that it kind of atomizes people further and exacerbated exacerbates a lot of the issues. Like you know, if you're you're talking about loneliness or depression or a sense of loss of connection and meaning by wedging by by sort of creating further wedges between even just like the long tail stranger interactions, familiar faces, people you might not be yeah. close friends with, but there's this sense of, I know you, you're around, you're part of this wider constellation of people that I interact with. If you start cutting those ties, yeah, yeah, then we end up in a system where people are then fed the possibility 
um, to meet their needs through, for instance, paid for services. Like you don't have enough people to talk to, go speak to a therapist. I, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to knock therapy. Therapy is a, an amazing thing, but but it just it can have the potential to create desires which can then only be met through capitalist means. Yeah, because well, the relationships are gone. The, the access to you know community supported agriculture is, yeah, is hard yeah. to find. All of these things, you know. I'd say it also links back though to the question around like the maybe I'm reading too much into it, but like the far right or the rise of the right. Because hmm. I mean, I for example, I used to work in a pub um, in the UK. Hmm. It's called the Radigand. And it was this tiny Radigand. little tiny little pub it was super traditional and like the the landlord terry was, was like he refused to let people use their phones in there he was like he was like a kind of he was like a kind of benevolent dictator he would go around oh. and demand that people paid tribute to the spirit of the pub right you had to like <laughs> if you arrived there you were part of a community you weren't you weren't a customer the staff were oh. always right the customer wasn't right so if you arrived there it had to be this like you're joining a community right and lots of the people who were a core part of the Radigan were people who basically, if they didn't have it, they might be quite lonely, right? And they yeah. would come and they'd be part of a community that would drink real ale. He would only serve real ale in the pub, right? Good so he's him. part of a movement called Camera, which is the campaign for real ale in the UK. Um, <laughs> and Ca Camera was formed in opposition to the, to the rise of the German export German lagers that right? was sort of flooded <laughs> into the UK, right? And so... Terry was like this proud, like real ale guy. And all these real ale enthusiasts would like go there and they would, oh. they would arrive from different towns and be like, I'm here because I'm part of the real ale community. All right. Um, at the same time as this, like a, probably in that, that time was that like the craft beer movement was emerging and the craft mm. beer movement is totally different. The craft yeah. beer movement is all like highly individualist. There's no like community in craft beer. It's all about, you know, yeah. please a customer with a particular kind of like, you know, new sort of, um hipster kind of thing right and 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 it was very interesting watching the craft beer movement and the and the, and the real ale movement clash right because mm -hmm. they're also politically different a lot of the kind of craft book real ale people were quite sort of working class you know old men and stuff and actually that was one of the, the sort of recruiting grounds of UK. Um, oh, wow. and these far right groups they'd be like you know your real beer is being attacked by these you know foreigners and stuff wow. and these like uh, capitalists who don't care about your traditions and who don't care about these elites who, and that's why Nigel Farage, he mm. always shows himself drinking real ale when he's huh. um, out on the campaign trail because he knows it appeals to a certain type of person. Um, and so as those, those pubs were under attack by like big landlords, conglomerates and all these companies, the far right was recruiting, right? Pushing those people into those types of, um, starting to get them on board with a lot of these sort of reactionary ideas. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, one of the responses is that you forced, you, you have to, you know, buy those, that type of community on a new market. Alternatively, mm -hmm. you sort of re react, you, you, re you retract back into kind of like reactionary politics and you try to join these sort of, you know, disgruntled groups. Yeah. And it's such a shame because the underlying desire to belong and to actually just have a space, which is not constantly under under attack by people who want to you know take i don't know it's just that there are more important things in life than finances <laughs> just making a quick buck but i do i do worry that these it kind of ties back to what you're saying about these cultural um, dynamics these these sort of social psychosocial games that get set into play where people believe that they want convenience they believe that they want some you know, and I use Starling, for instance, which is great. I can see my money coming in and out. I feel like I have more control of my finances. And yet it means that now if I'm making any kind of um, payment for expenses, of course, I'm going to use my card rather than my cash mm. because it means it's itemized. It's easier. So there is an interesting piece around that. But then the thing that I find quite disturbing is that whilst we're buying into this narrative and there are undoubtedly perks and perils, it's usually only after you kind of sucked into the system that some shit blows up and then you realize how under the cosh of digitization you really are. So for instance, um, you know, in, in Canada, when the government decided that they were going to create emergency economic measures orders that then meant that you could freeze people's accounts. And suddenly people who are protesting couldn't get money out of their accounts, buy groceries, pay bills. It's like, 
your life essentially is put on pause. I, I, it's just, that's terrifying. That yeah, was in Canada. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in a way, there's, there's like two different things there. So there's, there's something like the consequences of becoming dependent upon digital money. Mm -hmm. Then there's something else is like, how do you get to that point? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I do work on both of those kind of things and bear in mind, this applies to way, many, many things way beyond digital money. It applies to AI, it applies to all sorts of stuff, right? Um, it applies to all automation technologies, actually, mm. I'd say. Um, so the, one of the sort of, I would say one of the kind of illusions in capitalist economies is that the economy does what people want it to do, <laughs> right? Um, and maybe like a metaphor I would use to, I don't know if it's the best metaphor, but like, imagine you're like on a raft going down like the white water, you white water rafting. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. Now you might find that process exhilarating or you might find it terrifying, <laughs> no. but in the end, the raft isn't going down the river because you wanted to do that. Yeah. Right? The raft is going down because the river's pulling it down. <laughs> you happen to be, if you happen to enjoy that process, you doesn't mean you're the one who's driving it. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, in a capitalist system, I think it's quite similar. There are some people who authentically are excited by AI or digital money, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the reason why it's happening. That's coincidental. Like, mm -hmm. insofar as the system moves in the direction you want it to go, it's coincidental. Mm -hmm. The direction it's going to go in is towards greater expansion and acceleration. That's what it's going to do, right? If you happen to like that, you might perceive it as doing what you want to do but again yeah. it's not because of you all right mm -hmm. um that's a systemic force and so what can what the kind of ideologues of capitalism can do is that they will point to examples of particular people who like the trajectory mm. and then they'll say this is the reason why it's happening oh so and so thinks this, the digital payment's convenient all right they've learned to see it like that this must be the reason why this is happening. The reason why, you know, we, we, we're all turning to digital payments because we've all collectively decided that it's better for us. We're all turning to AI because we all realize it will save us time, et cetera, right? <laughs> um, and, and the reality is what's actually going on is you have a kind of bog standard automation process going on where the system is accelerating and expanding. And mm -hmm. what will actually happen is that even if you perceive yourself, even if you might have a hope in the beginning that maybe you will save time, you're not going to save time. What's going to happen is that the system will convert that technology into a new expectation that you're going to have to do more in the same amount of time. What's yeah, going to happen is you're going to become more fragmented and more like frenetic and busy. You're not going to end up more relaxed, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not like you control how AI is going to be used. Nobody mm. controls it. What's going to happen is there'll be systemic forces that basically convert it into increased speed and scale, all right? And so you'll be told, you better adopt this or you'll be left behind. Mm. AKA, like, the reason why you have to use this technology is not because it's gonna do something for you. It's gonna be like, if you don't use this, you're gonna be shafted by the system, yeah. all right? And that's what happens. And so like, we, you start with this illusion that it's gonna do something, then you become like dependent, dependent upon it. And once you become dependent upon it, then it opens up all these new vectors for control. So mm. in the case of digital payments, you, get, you become dependent upon it through all those automation processes, which includes some overt actors trying to push you, all right? Um, but then once, you be, once you're dependent, then it opens you up to a bunch of new things. Like for example, the Canadian government can then say, oh, now that you're dependent upon digital payment, um, we can use this as a vector via which to discipline you if we don't like you, right? Um, interestingly enough, that Canadian example is also one of the things that's being weaponized by the far right in the, in the digital payments debates. <laughs> and it shows you, it also shows you how um, a, lot, a lot of what's happening is that um, a, a lot of politics right now is being expressed through like curation, like the, the, the libertarians on the right always choose the Canadian example, right? Well, they've made a big thing out of, out of it because the, the, pers the people who were, who were shut down through that process were anti-vax truckers, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. Whereas historically, the main use of payments control has been welfare recipients. You control what huh. welfare recipients can spend, 
All right. That's the original form of payment censorship, but you never find the right curating that or talking about that. Yes, yes, yeah. Right. So if you're a left winger and you want to talk about the dangers of payment surveillance and stuff and censorship, that's your topic that you choose. Um, and so there's, there's this very, I'm always fascinated by like, which, which of the topics end up in the, um, kind of, yeah, which, which are being curated in, mm. in these sort of, um, yeah, you get, you get the point. <laughs> yeah, I get the point. But please, even just hearing you sort of like cite these, these examples of, as left and right, the first thing that comes up to my head is like, oh shit, does that make me left or right? And No, no, and no, actually, sorry, I, I don't mean to be so, that's so also, bi binary. No, 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 but, it, and it's not actually that, the, the point is more the fact that these, these stories are being used and curated in such a way that we can't, that it's almost like, if you if you do have some sort of allegiance or you perceive yourself to belong to a specific end of the political spectrum, that it forbids you to either through curation and lack of exposure to the story or because you don't want to be perceived as someone from the opposite side in quotation marks, um, it forbids you from looking at the bigger picture. So, you know, I care that Visa and MasterCard are now becoming the dominant players. I also care that the British government and others could... Um, basically control c and then weaponize my spending uh behavior etc like i care about the whole picture and i yeah, think yeah, sure. that one of the difficulties is that when when we're kind of sort of projected through these prisms of social media content and bubbles and influences that then kind of siphon us off into these competing factions how do we actually make the space to come together to have conversations with mm. people from all sorts of different perspectives to put all the pieces in, it's like we're all holding a, a small piece yeah, of the puzzle sure. and going, this is the truth, this is the truth. It's like, well, I mean, guys, let's put everything together and see yeah. what the picture creates. And then, because you've got to think about also, how do we begin to um, identify these systemic sort of dynamics and then seek to create alternative systems that through the fact that they're networked could actually form some sort of alternative to the systems that we're currently embedded in? Yeah. And so, I mean, I mean, when I'm using terms like left and right, I'm, it's just very crude shorthand. Actually, I don't even really like to refer to people as being left wing or right wing. I, my, 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 if, I, if I'm in a, like a nuanced mode, I'll be like, the, 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 the primary thing a person is, is a person. Right? Right, yeah. And they uh -huh. might have tendencies that are channeling through them. So like a person with libertarian tendencies right yes, now. Yes, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. A person with capitalist tendencies right now. You know, this person is not like determined to be this thing all their life. All right. It's a particular like impulse they might have going in right, in right now. This is why, for example, these very, you know, if I say like a right wing strategist, like it's a person who's very heavily vested about convincing other people about a particular position right now. Right. And yeah. they might mm -hmm. be curating people's experience to try and push them in a particular direction. And um, one of the fascinating things in, um, you know, talking about this sort of these, these politics right now is that you'll have maybe like an underlying principle and then an example of it. So, so, and, and, and so, so for example, the Canadian truckers being shut down mm. is an example of a group of people who are trying to express something and they're being shut down by some authority that doesn't like them. Okay? Yeah. Now mm. that principle is actually like, shared a lot of people across the political spectrum will, will, will agree that there's something wrong about that principle all right yeah. but what where you often show your politics <laughs> is in which of the examples you decide to showcase <laughs> yeah all right so for example i don't notice the libertarian community showcasing all the examples of welfare recipients being shut down mm. you know they seem to conveniently ignore that all right so and actually don't even necessarily mind that too much um, similarly, mm. maybe left wingers aren't spending as much time as they should be thinking about the Canadian truckers. All right. And as I say, a person who's yeah. in that kind of mode <laughs> of thought. And so, and I, that's what's so really fascinating is that there's a lot of the political battles, especially with, like, for example, Russell Brand and people, they're trying to say there's this thing like the elites versus the common man, the common person. Mm. Um, but really, they, the, the examples they're always choosing are the ones that appeal to the, the right-wing strategists, right? So they're mm -hmm. trying to associate a principle like, you know, elite power with always, you know, um, so they'll, they'll be like, you know, digital money is going to be used to stop you eating meat. Yes. Right? <laughs> they don't say something like digital money will be used to stop a Syrian refugee from a, a living a dignified life in a, in a, in a country that they're, yeah. they're trying to get to. They pick right? the story. They're mm -hmm. very much curated in a particular way. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the kind of, 
yeah, so in the blue and the sad in a, in a, in a way. <laughs> no, but I think it's important to unpack these things because often you're right, and this is the whole beauty of having a slightly longer form conversation is that where shorthand is used, it's nice to be able to unpack it and then, you know, really, really dig into the details. So mm -hmm. as someone who would like to have options available, so I want to be able to use cash, I don't particularly like authority, but I do like that there's a structure where we're generally protected from really awful things happening. So there's, there's a mixed, you know, yeah. um, what... And I'm, I'm invested in having um, a future in which there is social, some form of social cohesion that, that creates a sense of belonging, as well as individual independence. So some balance or dance between those elements. The current trajectory that we're heading down with the acceleration that you talked about, which I definitely feel on a day to day basis, um, the speed, the efficiency, we're kind of opt we're, we're humans trying to live up to a kind of technological speed, which is ask about face if you ask me but like how do we begin to resist or create alternatives yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, my my dominance way of framing it in the say the money realm mm -hmm. is around balances of power again um i think if you if you ask most people you know to so, so the one of the horrible things about say the cashless society debate is the pro digital people will always frame the situation as if you have to choose one or the other, right? Yeah, like yeah. People yeah. want digital, <laughs> they don't want cash. And so there's none of this there's none of this concept of like multiple things existing at the same time. Mm. So one of the dominant metaphors I use when I'm talking about cash is to talk about it as the bicycle of payments or the mountain bike of payments. All right. Because that immediately frames it as something that can coexist with Uber, all right, the yeah. Uber of payments. So the digital systems are very much the Uber of payments. You're, you're relying upon these large essential intermediaries or oligopolies of players that are gonna curate everything for you. So Apple Pay, for example, is going to be big tech companies and big finance companies. Um, and, um, you know, that's fine to some extent. People don't mind a degree of dependence upon large <laughs> institutions, but do you want total dependence? You know, so mm. using that transport metaphor, you could say, you know, hey, I find Uber useful, but do I want it to be the only way I can travel? Right. That's such a great metaphor. Right. That's a very different question. Most people mm -hmm. have a, a, a common sense understanding that something is useful when it's paired with other things that balance its power or will give you other options. You know, the mere mm -hmm. fact that Uber is allowed to operate in a city doesn't mean that the, the municipality now has to remove the bicycle lanes, right? Actually, if you're a good systems designer, you're thinking about how do I create a balance between these different things, right? Mm. And that's important for many different reasons, right? You know, resilience, but also just like, you know, it makes, better, it makes life better to have these combinations of things, right? Um, but with digital ideology, so bear in mind, if you, if, if you have a capitalist system where the predominant tendency is ex expansion and acceleration, mm. it's going to generate an ideology. And that ideology is going to be like, ever more acceleration and expansion. And in the current moment, that manifests as digital ideology, all right? Mm. It's politically impossible for a politician to go against it right now. You'll find no matter what political spectrum they're on, they always have to pay lip service to digital transformation, right? So they're always going to talk about this. Every business leader, every politician is going to talk about it because that's the dominant automation trajectory in the economic system. And you can't go against that because you have no power to control it. All right. So, so they, they will always be like, we must digitize, we must update our economy. And so on. You know, here in Germany, for example, the German elites have this huge angst that they're going to be left behind by digital automation. They better hurry up and so on. Right. So they're all paying lip service to this digital ideology, even though as human beings, they realize that what we actually need balances of power and resilience. So what they should be saying is we should be building multifaceted multimodal systems that have different yeah. elements to them but the ideology is like everything must be digital everything must be digital and within that that framing cash gets presented as being like the horse cart of payments well it's not mm -hmm. digital you can't automate it as well as digital money therefore it somehow must go right so everybody's internalized this this narrative of like cash being a horse cart and this even applies to like people who defend it. So you'll find like some well-meaning like labor politician in the UK being like, you know, speaking about cash as if it was like the horse cart that their granddad used to use. 
Like, yeah. Well, some people still use this thing. We must give them time to update and change and so on. And if they think they're being like, <laughs> Great like progressive or something, right? Um, yeah. but really, they're just buying into the same ideology. They're just putting a different spin on it. They're saying eventually mm. the horse cart will have to go, but let's, let's allow the people a little bit more time, right? Um, there's a lot of financial inclusion narratives have that dynamic. So, so what I'm mm. doing is to, to sort of reframe that to be like, actually, cash is way better than digital money and it should be exist in, is, in a balance of power with it, right? Because not only is cash public and digital money is private most of the time, which we have more autonomy with cash, you may have more dependence with digital money, you have privacy versus surveillance, you have informal economies versus pure formalization, even simple things, for example, like, you know, your kid wants to sell some lemonade on the side of the road. Are you going to force them to have to basically pay the, the executives of Visa and MasterCard to do this, All right? Or are you going to allow mm. a form of payment that doesn't require that? Um, and so a lot of the, once you start to frame these terms, these things in, in balance of power terms, it becomes a lot more politically viable, especially for like centrists who mm. used to, you know, buying into the sort of standard ideology a lot of the time, you know, being a little bit like insipid with stuff. You say, you, you, even you go to like a bougie Londoner who's got really into their like Monzo cards and stuff and really into this vibe, right? And you talk about balance of power, actually yeah. they can't argue against it. And um, everyone wants to have their agency at some level yeah, at and, least. And it probably applies to like big tech questions as well, you know, so beyond digital, digital money, right? You could say, mm. okay, fine, I'm not going to do a full frontal assault on, you know, Google and all these players which have so much power, but let's start thinking like, you know, beyond these kind of um, digital fetishization and um, mm. well, especially in a future it. where there's like climate change, geopolitical instability and like mass burnout um, hmm. and addiction to the, these systems, there's going to be probably be like a cultural backlash. So I'm, I'm curious about the cultural. <laughs> no, no, this is, this is really interesting that so the, the cultural burnout and also the acts of rebellion that we can engage in so for me an act of rebellion is using cash and continuing to use cash which means intentionally reintroducing that as a habit in my day-to-day -day life but i'm also curious about um systemically if there's anything that we can do and also what do we do about cultural burnout or do you think that's to some extent more or less inescapable and that will cause a reaction that then yeah causes us to you know of course well, i think it's important to I mean, the re bear in mind you know, cash is one element of a broader process. The, the attack mm. on cash is part of a broader thing that happens in the capitalist systems where you're expanding and accelerating, right? So mm -hmm. and there was a point in the 1800s and stuff where cash was at the leading edge of a capitalist system. This is what you would use to expand yeah. your markets and stuff. It's like in relative terms now, it's creating friction, even though people actually really often love the cash system. Uh, at, a, at a sort of systemic level, it's becoming unacceptable. And that applies to many other things beyond cash, actually, right? So right now in the AI debate that's going to happen, they'll be like, mm. oh, you, you, you still use your brain to like write this <laughs> thing? Don't you realize that you're, you're wasting uh, productivity like this? You should have uh, upgrade immediately. You know, this, this debate goes on, this, this type of stuff goes on and on and on. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, in any system that's expanding and accelerating, it's going to hit boundaries at some point, right? So like it's, it's already hitting resource boundaries. So mm -hmm. you know, climate change is a particular weird example because it's, it's sort of like a, it's not like a resource boundary, but it's like the activities of an accelerating economy are creating in like an unlivable environment. Yeah. Um, but then there's also like actual resource boundaries, like you know, massive like eco side and like just mm -hmm. destruction of everything, you know, in favor of like mass consumer goods and stuff. But then there's also, so there's an ecological element, but then there's also like a human body element. Like people literally just can't process this much stuff. So you just become yeah. like dazed and confused at some point or burnt out and um, uh, or subject to extreme anxieties and so on and things like that. Mm. So I think at some point that forces reactions. Yeah. Um, so in the, one of the worst elements of like the stuff I have to do around fintech and stuff is you find all these fintech execs. And they're always like some 40 year old to 50 year old guy or something. And they're kind of rich and they're like a little bit out of touch with like youth culture, but they own mm -hmm. the platforms that they're promoting as being like 
the the future for the youth, right? And they always mm. their marketing departments always use young people as their kind of hook to make older people feel like they're behind the times. Yeah. They go, oh, look at all the young people they're using this. The young people want this. The young people want this. Blah 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 blah. Right? Which is kind of like what all capitalists do, where they're trying to make you know your your teenage populations like the most susceptible to trying getting new products because they they're already trying to like differentiate themselves from their parents right so they're the mm. most vulnerable population for inserting new products into them um but these 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 fintech execs sit there and they're like oh yeah of course we're you know like we're ahead of the curve and stuff and i'm like you're not ahead of the curve you know actually if you probably were to look at like think, like project ahead what's going to start to happen culturally with these people who you basically sort of give these paternalistic stories about like oh your silicon valley tech is for the good of the young people Ugh. it's like that's bs at some point they're going to turn BS. on you all right um they're going to start to see through this and they're going to start to be um feel crap they'll they'll notice the incredible anxiety they'll have to start to feel all the kind of like hmm. um pointlessness of it all um i really think you're starting to see that um maybe i'm wrong but like i if, if i was if i was giving advice to companies I'd be like, drop digital hype. If you want to be ahead of the curve, you've got to start imagining a return to slower things because that's what people are probably going to start demanding at some point. Oh, yes. I am first in line for that. Or maybe fifth in line. Or maybe against, further back. <laughs> but then you're going to go against the trajectory of the system. So it's like, um, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting battle. I think um. sometimes I think it's kind of a foot in both worlds. And that's... that's um, sometimes intolerable for other reasons which is just that that dissonance of holding both and when both of those things are battling it out and it's kind of you know wanting to do the i don't know yeah it, it can be tricky um, yeah, nothing i'm realizing that go on i was gonna say I, and i don't want to sound too <laughs> absolutist about these things because you know i tend to focus on quote unquote like capitalist processes which are particular mm. forces that emerge in large-scale economies but there are other forces that emerge, right? There are other impulses that people have. The question is, can those impulses win out against the other, you know, the more dominant forces? So the dominant force in our large-scale interdependent systems is towards speed, scale, accumulation, all those processes that get referred to as capitalist. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many other you know, values that human beings have that they try to express. It's just whether you can express those very well in the in, within the economy. Um, so even the most like virulent of people you might call capitalists, they're only really that person when they're at, at work, when they leave the work, they suddenly turn into somebody else, right? They've suddenly become like a family man or something who likes going mm -hmm. to the lake or something, you know? <laughs> so um, there are yeah. ways of trying to harness and lots of the alternative economy movements or consciousness movements, lots of different movements are trying to, in a way, like, find ways to mobilize other spirits in the economy as it were you know like mm. um so yeah that's one way of maybe putting more hopeful spin on it <laughs> <laughs> no i mean i think you used the word multimodal early and i think we are um, multimodal beings like it's not we're not just one instrument we're entire orchestras and i think sometimes we forget to let the other instruments in orchestra play and actually if you can find a way to active activate those people will lead from a different place but then again it's it's how much the yeah, the context yeah. and the the system demands that only one instrument be playing and how much we're willing to rebel against that so i realize we're coming to time um and i want to go to the the kind of extra gentle kind of deep questions around but before we go to that bit um to close this part of the conversation i'd love to ask you especially given what you're saying about this acceleration and all the craziness that goes on when you're doing your research, is how do you orient yourself towards life and beauty and hope on dark days? Um, um, well, I guess I kind of, how do I do that? I'm a lot, I guess I'm a lot more kind of, Buddhisty in my approach nowadays, where I sort of try to be like, like not react as much to the sort of terrifying trends that I see, <laughs> or or to try and like, yeah, you know, I don't know if it's a Buddhisty approach, but you know, like when a Buddhist would say like, don't identify too much with the particular 
thing, right? Um, it's yeah. a little bit like that. I have, I've, I've developed practices to try and um, create parts of my life that don't rely upon um, identifying with with my work and stuff. Mm. Um, so, you know, in general, that would be like <laughs> playing lots of music, guitar and stuff, mm. ah. going, uh, going to the gym or climbing <laughs> um, or, yeah, growing chilies. Embodied practices. Growing ch- I love chilies. <laughs> yeah. Those things like that. Because there's a strange, there's a strange problem that afflicts quite a lot of like activist people as they start to like imagine that there's a, they only have like one mode, mm-hmm. which is like, you know, everything is like critique constantly. Yes. And that's like my main yeah. identity, and that's the only thing I have. And then and you then you hang out with like people, you know, you go to like for example, Mozambique or something, and you meet like a surf instructor on the beach, a local, and he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, like <laughs> I just surf here yeah, on the beach, and it's that's what my life is. You know, there's something like, so beautiful to that and radical. Yeah, and it's way. like you, you suddenly realize, I mean, the world's a big place, right? There's thousands mm-hmm. of like, you know, more than thousands of like little subcultures. Everybody is subject to at least some extent the same forces, but they don't have necessarily the have they don't necessarily have to be living their life constantly in that. So yeah. for somebody like me, though, I'm forced to like a large parts of my life involve having to like constantly immerse myself in like the dark systemic forces of like vast financial <laughs> systems and things. So I very overtly have to create spaces that give mm. me some, uh, yeah, space Respite. from that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which I didn't used to have, but then I had severe burnout. Mm. Um, so I have had to be forced to do it. Live and learn. Yeah. Um, and if people want to find out more about you, I do have some of your links, but just in case you have specific places you'd like to direct people, what's the best place to I find think, you? I think actually my Substack is a place I'm most excited about now. Great. I would. I used to say like Twitter. I mean, you can still go on Twitter by me, but like no longer. Um, but the, my Substack, which is brettscott.substack.com, which is called Altered States of Monetary Consciousness. That's what I'm actually <laughs> excited about doing. I actually really enjoy doing those pieces. Some of them are a bit like esoteric and stuff, but they're, my Substack is like an ongoing project of building out, I guess, like ways of seeing money and the processes around that. And I I'll always kind of have fun doing the pieces. I'm currently working on a piece of doing on how to build origami stable coins. So I don't even know what that is. Yeah, but we don't well, have much time left. So, are you going to write about it on your Substack? Can we direct yeah, people gonna, in it's that? It's going to come out. Yeah, so that, that's the kind of thing. It's like these sort of slightly well, esoteric uh, things, which have some learning element to them, but also like political content. But I'm trying to make it so it's a bit lighter, maybe, or a bit more like interesting than reading stuff in the news. Okay. Um, so yeah. All right. So head over to Substack. Brilliant, Brett. Thank you. Thank you.